right, well, thank you and good morning. So I think Jack laid out all of the things why we want to do what we want to do. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a little cold water on that and, and, and talk about some constraints. Um, and, and because they're hitting the Census Bureau uh, right now pretty, pretty good. So, uh, so the theme about us is learning too much about the world um, through geographic information. So I, I'm not going to spend too much time on these first couple slides. We just sort of talk about you know, wh why we want to do this. We want to we take geographic information and mash it up with, with other data, gain new insights. And Jack did a really good job uh, of talking about that just a minute ago. And in particular, we want to bring stuff about about the economy, about society, about our environment, and we want to bring that together so that we can make better decisions um, so that we can improve the lives of, of, of everybody. So, uh, you know, like was just said, geography has been at the heart of, of the work of the Census Bureau um, for decades. It's, it's the foundation of all of our surveys and censuses that, that we do that, that we then use to pr produce data products to give to our, our users. And in particular, we, we have uh, a team of geographers at the Census Bureau that have created many of these sort of foundational elements. So you know, we, we have a, a, a national address list that is, is the foundation of the census. It's, it's, you know, everyone's going to get mailed a, a survey uh, or an invitation to, to do the survey online next year. And it's going to be based on this address list. Um, we have all the legal boundaries and, and what have in a complete digital representation of all the roads in the country. So our geographers are sort of at the heart of this uh, sort of this innovative um, approach to, to looking at uh, our country through, so through the lens of geography and helping, uh, then working with our demographers and economists and, and whatnot to sort of produce this sort of value-added uh, information that is, that is used by, the, by governments, by business, and what have you. And so, you know, we, we get to do fun stuff like this. People love uh, to, to rank things in our in, in from our data. Um, so, you know, this, this is sort of the fruits of all this labor. And so one of the things, you know, I think I got some stuff here that's at the county level. One of the things that people tell me all the time when, when we're out um, talking about our data is they want the data to be more timely and they want it to be more granular. And most of the products that we produce at the Census Bureau are based on surveys and, and censuses, so sample surveys. And, and in the mid 20th century, the sample survey was, was revolutionary and the Census Bureau led that, led that work to sort of transform how we measure society. But sample surveys have issues now. People don't want to respond, they're too busy, um, they're more expensive. Um, the fact that folks don't want to respond sort of uh, degrades data quality. And even if that wasn't the case, you cannot produce timely granular data with a survey. So much like the stuff that Jack was just talking about, Census is trying to modernize, to exploring new source data um, from you know, sensors, from business transactions, from what have you. And if you're bored, some, like maybe for the flight home, free online. So I wrote about this in a Journal of Economic Perspectives article earlier this spring, it sort of lines out kind of the thinking of not just the Census Bureau, but many other statistical organizations around the world about how we can use this information to modernize and serve our customers better. But since geography is often at the heart of many of the, of the data products we produce, we really have to start thinking about the privacy implications of geospatial information. So much of the data that we want to use with the tools of GIS have some sort of privacy policy around them, whether that's you know, a mobile app, whether that's the car you're driving, whether that's Census Bureau data. So our data are actually protected by statute, so by law, we cannot, we cannot release information that can be used to identify an individual or individual business. And if we do that, and not only do that, uh, my staff likes to say that I'm the one that's gonna go to jail. So, uh, so, so I don't want to go to jail. Uh, um, but privacy protections, you know, so, so for census, it's, it's statute. But in the private sector, things are more ad hoc. So I'm going to give you a little, a little uh, example here. So uh, if you, I was out here at the Hoya a few weeks ago. And sitting, there's a Starbucks right up the street here that I was sitting in. So I did, this is the Google Street View. Um, and so Google 
uh, anonymizes the street view. See, see the license plates are fuzzed out there, okay? So that's the privacy protection in, in Google Street View, okay? But the problem is that contextual knowledge breaks anonymization. And anonymization is largely what most people do to protect the privacy of the information in some database. You, you take out the names and the addresses. Maybe you do a couple other things. But th this is essentially how we, how we do this. So uh, this is, a, this is a, a Google Street View image um, of, well, my house. Okay? And this was taken several years ago. And the reason there's contextual information here is, well, that's my son's car. And you can tell it's during the day. Um, and this is his girlfriend's car. <laughs> so I think, I think this is when they were seniors in high school. And the, and, the, and, the, and the policy at our house was that they couldn't be home unsupervised. I'm sure they were just doing homework. But this is a cute example. And, and by the way, they're getting married this, this, later this summer. And I'm going to use these slides in the, in the. So. All right. So this is, a, this is sort of a cute example from my own personal experience of, of how, how the information that's just exploding, that is really useful and we love to use it, sometimes maybe has some some uses that, that we didn't intend. And you know, Jack did a great job. You know, so there's lots of information about addresses online. You can use this to, to add things. And, and so you know, your typical cadastral information has got all sorts of, of PII in it that's available free online. So the thing that's got the Census Bureau and, and other organizations worried, and, and people are sort of waking up to this, and this is an old result from some folks in computer science. And, 2003, and, and I'm not going to do the formulas and all that sort of stuff, um, but the basic result is too many statistics published from a private database with, that, have, that are too detailed will reveal basically the underlying micro database from which the statistics were computed. And it doesn't matter whether it's census data or, or business data, it's all private databases, okay? There's a fundamental theorem, it's math. There's not much we can do about it. Um, and then you have this other thing, is that once you've done that, then you can use all of this external data that Jack talked about mashing up. You can use that information to then re-identify the individual units in that database. So from a privacy protection standpoint, this is, this is sort of a, a wake-up call. So being good stewards of our data, and being aware of the, of, the, of the database reconstruction theorems, we set about saying, well, how big of a risk is this to Census Bureau data products? So we took the 2010 census, and we set about doing the, the reconstruction. So we could exactly reconstruct 46% of the population based on their census block. So census block's a pretty small unit of geography, usually like, 30 to 50 housing units, sex, age, race, and ethnicity. And we could reconstruct those for 46 of the population exactly. If we allowed a little fuzzing in age, we could get 71%. That's 219 million individuals that we reconstructed the, the micro data, those, those variables for from our data. Now, that's not that big of a deal. But then we go out and we, and we used commercial data that was available at the time in, in 2010 and linked those together. And we were able to, to re-identify 45% of the population. Okay? Now, inside, we took that, those re-identifications and we tested it against the sort of the gold standard truth. And 38% of those were accurately re-identified. Now, fortunately, an external attacker doesn't have the internal data, and they don't know for sure whether they've correctly re-identified people. So if this is my micro database from the census, you know, this is kind of what we've done. We've now revealed the identity of, of some of the folks in our data. Maybe with some, you don't know for sure that you've done that. Um, but what we're worried is here's the 2020 census. 
The amount of data that's available out there right now compared to the data that was available in, in 2010 is orders of magnitude higher. So we're worried we're going to get something like this where an even larger portion of the population could be re-identified from their confidential census records. So what are we going to do about it? Um, <coughs> again, one of the, the key things here is the things that makes the census data so easy to attack through these, through these means is that we produce the data at the block level. It's the fact that it's the geographically granular information that we're providing that's used by, by folks for doing redistricting. Um, blocks are kind of the pixels that are used to draw legislative districts. Um, but the block is, is just giving lots of information. So what we're going to use um, is, is a form of formal privacy protection called differential privacy. Um, so census has worked on privacy protection for years, so I guess this is us continuing to take a, a leadership role in, the, in this space. Um, others that are using differential privacy now include Apple and Google and uh, Microsoft. This was invented at Microsoft. Um, so basically what we're doing is, is we're, we're adding noise to the data in a certain way that allows us to produce as accurate a statistics as possible, but still provide some formal, provable privacy protection. So we've been actually using differential privacy since 2008 in an application called On the Map. And On the Map is, is really detailed data on jobs. So every wor worker connected to their employer through this sort of infrastructure that we have here. That the base unit is, is data from state unemployment insurance uh, offices. And with that, so here's uh, like the, the gas lamp district here in San Diego. Th these are all of the jobs contained in the gas lamp district. And not only do we know where the jobs are, we know where the workers who perform those jobs, we know where they live, okay? But their residence location, again, is a very telling, a very disclosive thing. So we use differential privacy to protect that so that we can do these cool maps that show where the flow of workers in and out of the gas lamp district. So on the left, you have where workers who live in the gas lamp district work, and then on the right were all the workers who work there <coughs> where they live. And we can do this because we've protected their privacy through, through differential privacy. So the so last thing I want to talk about is, is differential privacy provides this nice framework of thinking about the trade-off between the accuracy of the statistics that you release, um, in our case it's census statistics, but in other domains, it would be something else, um, and the privacy protection. So this is just a, a, a crude graph. Um, and basically, what the application that you're doing, you can draw this graph very accurately. Um, and, and it sort of describes the technology that you have to trade privacy versus accuracy. But the problem is, other than, you know, so my users, they want to be up on the upper right, the high accuracy, no privacy. I mean, that's what, we're all in this business because we want to learn something about the world from the data. That's where you want to be. But our privacy, accurate, uh, privacy advocates, they want to be farther to the left. They want to maintain the privacy of the individuals contained in the data that you're, you're releasing. So where do you locate on this curve? Okay, I think this is going to be a discussion in our society for many organizations for years to come. Um, achieving the vision that Jack laid out is going to require some thinking about this very issue. So we're being forced to right now because this, this, we have a statute that talks about this. Okay? So I have a statute that says I probably can't be on that no privacy end of the curve. Okay? So... Um, you know, we're going to have some many discussions at the Census Bureau about where we think we're going to be on that curve, with the, you know, talk with stakeholders and stuff like that. But for 2020, we're going to have to decide where, where we're going to be. Um, but I think going forward, you know, and, and again, some other organizations have started, started using this, but this is going to be where, where we are. So thank you very much. Thank you.